Okay, one of the things, one of the things that the Spirit of the Lord just spoke to me about, um, something that I was shown that I haven't really spoken about. Um, there's another book going to be coming out that's a second book on my heavenly visitation, the first book that I, that I wrote that started this whole thing. Um, um, there's other things that I was shown that I, I did not include in that book because I felt like I didn't want to write the book to begin with because it's very personal and private. And obviously, it put me out everywhere, and I, don't, I didn't want that. So I didn't put everything in there. One of the things that was shown to me that, that I need to tell you about in the, it, right away in this session, and I'm kind of, believe it or not, I get kind of nervous about this. I'm not, I mean, I'm not nervous to stand in front of you, but I don't, I'm not this kind of person. I would rather go through my whole life and not be noticed. I'm fine with just being at home. Um, I spend time at home, and, and maybe I say four words in a day sometimes. Um, I, I mean, I, Kathy and I just sit there in the presence of God, and we're fine with that. We're just fine with that. So everything that I'm doing is not, is not what I want, would want to do, because I don't need the attention. I actually don't want any attention. It actually wears me out. Because there's a lot of pressure. And, you know, so it's, it, I get nervous sometimes when the Lord tells me you got to say this. Because I don't want to say it. Because I know, I know how I think about things before I came to the knowledge of all these, um, these, these things that are in the Bible. It, it, I didn't always believe I was very critical. So... You know, you can tell I have a lot of European in me. No, no, I'm just kidding. But I, I am. I'm from. I'm from Hungary. I mean, my, my, my roots are in Hungary, and um, and I I'm I'm a very critical person until until I met Jesus, and then I realized that I could actually take it easy on myself by not judging other people. It would actually go well with me, and so then I'm not judged by the same standard that I judge people. So it, it kind of relieves the pressure in a weird way. You And I met Jesus and it kind of changed me. But I, I want to tell you that there's a lot of things that, um, that I have to teach now that are not widely accepted because um, the system is set up with all the fellow ministers to make a lot of money, you know, and gain a lot of influence and sell books and be popular and things like that. But if that's not your goal, then you always are uh, considering like, okay, well, what do the people need? And what the people need is to learn how to walk step by step in the spirit for yourself. Instead of just coming and hearing somebody that's been to heaven, it's what if you had heaven on earth? You know, what if you, because it says that in the Old Testament, it says that you have days of heaven on earth. And it's talking about God intervening and you walking with God and having him come into your life. And this was in the Old Testament. So one of the things that the Lord spoke to me about that I, I have not shared because it's in, it would be in that next book. But one of the things it, that I saw that I'm going to get a lot of criticism for, for saying all this. But Jesus is actually more concerned and, about your character Amen. than anything else. Yeah. So like when you go to heaven... When I went to heaven, my body wasn't with me. It was on the operating table. And parts of my mind, will, and emotions stayed with my body. They did not make it to heaven. But I was still Kevin. But I was at rest with Jesus. So I wasn't nervous. I didn't say things to get the conversation going. You know, I wasn't trying to prompt or push him in any kind of situation. I wasn't uh, uncomfortable because those parts of me didn't make it. Okay, so I saw a whole bunch of things that were not actually just said because what I love about heaven is is that whatever you don't get by the spoken word up there, you get it anyway because it's part of the environment of heaven is, is knowledge and wisdom. So it's really bright there. So when I was there, it was so bright 
that I didn't have a shadow. I looked down and I was on a path and I was, I was in paradise, which is this big, it just looks, um, I mean, I took my staff to a place on Lake Lucerne um, up in the mountains part where we ate. And I said, this is what heaven looks like. It's these mountains, these green mountains right here. And it was just like heaven. And, um, and I said, people are everywhere, but there's no buildings. It's just all these green fields and um, snow-capped mountains. And, and um, I said, it's just like this right here. And we, I showed them. There was a place we were at. I said, this is what it looks like right here. And um, people want to come up to you while you're there and they want to start to talk to you but when they talk to you they want to tell you about what Jesus did for them while they were on the earth so everybody wants to come up and know know about you and what Jesus did for you and they want you to testify about his faithfulness and then they want to tell you what happened in their life and it's just constant people are just wanting to talk to each other and fellowship but I, I was on a path and there was the river of life was down was down um, in this one area that flowed from the throne room and it came out the throne room was like a big building and um, it came out and flowed past and the water looked like melted diamonds it looked like liquid diamonds and you could see the bottom but it was just glistening and um, it was full of life of course but people were swimming in it. They were drinking from it. But the kids, there was a lot of children in heaven that didn't have parents. And there was parents there. But some of the children didn't have their parents. And they were taken early. And so they automatically go to heaven at a, till a certain point, which I don't know what the age was. It seemed like it was up to the age of seven or eight or nine or ten or whatever. You know, I, I hate to even say that. But um, they were all playing with, with, and Jesus was playing with them. And I remember looking down at the path, and then I thought, I don't have a shadow, but it's so bright. And so I looked up, and it was this beautiful blue sky, just like here. And then there was, the green was really green, just like here. And then the white of the mountains was pure and then Lucerne, if, if on a certain day, I've been there where the light hits a certain way and it's just this beautiful green, like emerald, and it's just, it's just so pure. And I remember thinking, where's the sun? And there was no sun, but it was so bright in heaven. But I also remember not feeling any, the feelings that I felt here. I didn't feel alone, I didn't feel rejected, I didn't feel anything like that. But yet, I was still Kevin. You know, I still, you know, was Kevin. But my heritage was my father God. You know, he was my father. And everything about the earth, I was completely disconnected from. I didn't miss the chocolate here or anything, you know. <laughs> and there was, there, there, there was just beautiful. But I want to tell you this because what I realized was we try to judge heaven and the things of God by what we experience down here. And that was what I wanted to share with you, if you don't mind, for like the hour that we have together, is what I saw in heaven, which I didn't plan on doing, because I have 20, you know, 20 pages left still of my notes. But I, want, I felt like this is what the Lord said. He said, explain to them that it's character, and it's who you are as a person, not the anointing or the giftings or mantles, or even necessarily associations, even though that's important. But you have to admit, who trained Enoch to walk like he did? There were certain individuals, like who did they have to teach them? They're, but they, they were so successful. I mean, Enoch walked with God to where he disappeared, and... I mean, I, there's people I want to disappear. They, I want them to disappear, but it's for the wrong reason. But see, that I'm just trying to get you all to laugh, you know. But it means to do the right thing to where God said, I, I don't want you to be apart from me anymore. I want you to stay with me. Think about that. That God said, you know what? I, I love you so much. I don't want you to go. Just stay. 
Because when you, read, when you read about Enoch and you do research, that's what happened. God just decided, you know what, don't go back. Just stay with me. If you read what is said about Enoch, he pleased God so much that God, God uh, looked at him as a friend. And, and, and would, would rather have him stay with him. And, you know, there was conversations that I've never spoken ever. And I don't want to begin here. But I will tell you that I, the things that I was told by Jesus is unfathomable. When I realized how much he loved me, how much, how much I meant to him, it, it made me not want to come back. I'm just telling you, if I would tell you what he's told me, I always, my first reaction is, why do people treat me the way they do then? Because, you know, I'm, real, I'm like so valuable, just like you all are. You're all valuable, but down here, it's just a struggle. So a lot of what is down here with you doesn't, doesn't make it through. And when I was with him, there was no conversations ever about the anointing or the gifts. I mean, if you add up the hours that I've been with him, I mean, it was 45 minutes the one time, but there was times where I've been with him a long time that you don't know about. But I, I mean, the things that were said there changed my life, but it didn't have to do with the things that are focused on today by ministry. Interesting, huh? All right, so the way that the Lord talked to me, and this is what he told me to talk to you about, is, is that our character, once it's formed, is permanent. And that's who you are forever. It's based on how you're formed back to the original. So what he talked to me about that I didn't really get into in the first book, but he loves Moses. Even though Moses messed up, he loves Moses. Jesus talked about Moses a lot. I'm like, man, if he would talk about me like he talks about Moses, you know. <laughs> but I didn't get to meet Moses. But he talked about him a lot, and he used him as an example. But here's why. Moses didn't claim to want to do anything that he was doing. In fact, he didn't want to do any of that. And he was always like, you know, can you talk for me? Can you, you, you go and tell him, you know, I'll stay here. You know, and he was like, you know, um, so the real test for Moses was when God said, listen, I'm going to take out all these people, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you a nation, because me and you are fine. That's what he said. Me and you are fine. It's going to go well with you. He said, but I'm going to wipe out these people for their unbelief and their stiff-necked or their rebellion. And I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to make a nation out of you. And the maturity in character was that Moses said no. Because I don't know that any of us could say that. Because that's a compliment, right? It was a test. It was a test. And Moses did it right. Why? Because God's character was at risk if he wiped the people out. If you remember what Moses said, if you do this, all of Egypt will say you brought uh, your people out and killed them. And your name would be profaned instead of famed. And that's why Moses was God's friend. Is because... Moses was thinking more about God's, God's pers what the, how people viewed him and the witness than, than um, being complimented and being promoted. In other words, to be God's friend, you have to stick up for him. And that's what I was asked to do when I was, I was sent back twice one of them you don't know about, but I was sent back and I was told 
to defend me and the Father. Jesus said, will you go back and defend me and the Father? Because we're not doing any of these diseases. This COVID, this is not of us. And he told me to come back and defend the Father and him that we are not generating this disease. He said, the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But he said, we've come to give you life and life more abundantly. And he said, will you defend me and my father? And I said, yes, I will. And so what I did was I I started teaching on healing. and If you look at all the messages throughout the last three years, it's been really defending that God is a good God and that his goodness, Paul said in, in Romans 2, leads people to repentance. Yeah. So it's not the fear of punishment or the fear of hell. I know that people preach that way, but Paul did not preach that hell was the reason why you don't, you know, that you should accept Jesus. I mean, nobody wants to go to hell. Even the people that say they do, they don't want to. And once they get there, they definitely want their return ticket. But Paul didn't preach that way. If you notice, and and do the research if you don't believe, but I did the research and he did not preach hell. Even though he believed in it, he said it's the goodness. It's actually the revelation of the goodness of God that leads people to repent. And so we serve God because we have a revelation that he's a good God and he's a good father, not just for the fear of punishment. So you know what happens? People convert to Christianity because they don't want to go to hell. They don't want to be punished, right? But what happens, you got to look at your own heart and say, were you, were you really legitimately converted? Because what I found is, and I did the studies on all the revivalists, you know, all the, all the ones that you know have, that met in Geneva 500 years ago. And when you, when you read them, they were concerned. The reason why was, is that you don't have a proper view of God if you're afraid of him all the time. Because then you don't see him as a loving, good father. You see him as a disciplinarian and maybe even a dictator. But see, the God that, that, that I met, the Jesus that I met, he gave me free will. So he offers the truth. He offers the way. And he offers for you to become a son or a daughter of God. But you have the choice not to do the things that you're asked. That is because he is actually a good God. It's kind of strange, but he doesn't force anyone to do anything. Now, he will force the enemy to do his bidding. So in the book of Revelation, you see a lot of things where he, if you look in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, you'll see that he says, I will go and hook Russia and bring them down. I will hook them in their mouth. That's that chessboard that that nobody gets to see. That's that level where God is playing with the enemy and you have nothing to do with that. Those kind of things that are written in Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Revelation, they will happen even if people don't listen. That's a part of God that we have nothing to do with because that's a whole nother level of his schedule, of his, of his uh, timeline that, that is not allowable in our understanding. I'm just telling you, this is hard. But you've got to understand that there are things that God has decided that you have nothing to do with. And you are not included in on those timelines. So I say this because with character, your character, if you live your life with character, you will work within the confines of the boundaries that God has established. 
so that you become an asset in every way and you become a friend. And so what you do is you tell the Lord, if you don't want to tell me, that's fine. I will just do it strictly because you say so. He will tear up. He will, have, he will be so touched that you will just trust him and not include yourself in something that is none of your business. And the Lord will say that. He will say that's none of your business. He will, he will tell you that's between me and them. He won't, he won't tell everything that he knows, especially if it's about somebody else. Because he's working with somebody else. Okay, so when I was in heaven, when I was in paradise, when I was with Jesus at the throne, it, my character, who I was as a person, was enough to operate in heaven. The things that I operate in down here, I would say 80% of it is not even necessary. Like, 80% of what you worry about never happens. 80% of what you think is, you know, not, what well, is it even, gonna, even true? You, you oscillate, and it's like a roller coaster ride with your adrenal glands and your chemistry in your body just over thoughts and crazy people, crazy people acting up. But then it, it just goes. It's, it, ha things happen, and then they, it, it just, th so things don't stay the same. It just oscillates based on traffic, based on when you get your bills. And, and everything is trying to push you into some sort of scenario that passes because it's, it's not as permanent as you as a person and how you deal with it in your character. So when you get to heaven, you literally, like, like uh, what I saw, I saw um, I was taken to Mount Zion. And it's the city of David. It's on, this, it's on the side of the holy city. It's on the, on the, on the, it's not the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount is a Roman garrison that was built because Jesus said that there not, won't be not one stone left on another, but that goes over well. But the city of David is where the Gihon Springs are, which would be the water for where the temple was. And the, the, the city of David is Mount Zion. And so it's, it's right there on the side. And, um, it says that we, we have not come to Mount Sinai, which is flames and fire and thunders and earthquakes, but we've come to Mount Zion, which is a different word. And it says, where the spirits of just men made perfect are, it says. And that's what I'm talking about. So if you meditate on that, God will show you what I'm trying to tell you about your character is that the, the, the men and women that are on display are these, the spirits of, of righteous made perfect. And they're on display. And I saw them. I saw all of your heroes in the Bible standing there on as trophies on display up the mountain. And we got to see them. And they were like pillars that had changed and done God's will for that, that era of, of time. And they had accomplished and added to the end result that we have where the heavenly city comes down. And I, I wondered, because all the pressure, and, and you know, I had all this ministerial training and went to all these different colleges and things and was rubbing shoulders with all the ministers that you know. And I was like, I don't want this. I want to be a friend of God. And, and it was weird because you would think that being a minister would be that friend of God. But it, it seemed like there was like this thing that made it feel like they were really working it. 
I don't know how to say it because I'm going to get in trouble, but you know, I have to say it, is that in heaven, you didn't work at who you were. You were who you were. And that was like totally acceptable. And I thought, you know what? We're like a bunch of puppies down here that discover we have a tail. And then we just chase the tail around. And for seven hours a day, we're chasing our tail. And, and you know, even the adult dogs are like, oh, boy. It's like something new to entertain with, you know. And then when I got my pilot's license, the pilot said to me, he goes, you're like a puppy with two tails. <laughs> I was so happy. But to the mature, they're like looking at that and they're thinking, you know, why do kids find so much excitement in this little box of, of something that you buy that's a toy? But it's because they're expanding. Their mind is expanding and they're wanting to discover. It's like a journey. It's a discovery thing. But why do we stop that when we get older? The simplicity of just being able to dream and expand and, and, and be able to discover and find things. And it doesn't cost you a whole bunch of money, you know. And I realized that I was always going to be Kevin. And Jesus never called me anything else except Kevin. I didn't have a title. I was fully accepted by him as Kevin. I didn't have a title. Anything that I had achieved down, uh, achieved down here, I had the understanding that was because of his grace that I was able to do that. It had nothing to do with me. And it's embarrassing because everybody down here thought that I had done all these things and accomplished all this. And I would have been dead so many times if it wasn't for God's grace. And I would have failed every test if he hadn't been there. So how could I ever think that I achieved anything? And, and even the money that came in, there were times where money came in and I wasn't even believing for it. So how could you say it was my faith? There were times where I was healed and I didn't believe for healing. I actually doubted. There are times where I was healed where I thought I'm going to have to live with this the rest of my life. But how many people will admit that? Well, what happens is, is when you go to heaven and you realize that when you take away all the things that are just in this earth realm, 80% doesn't go with you. But what does go with you is not the anointing, not the gifts, not your status, not what... I mean, I didn't even think about what I had done. I was just in the image of God and the way Jesus treated me, I thought I was his favorite. And I'm, I know you, could, you think that's funny, but I really thought I was his favorite because the way he talked to me, I knew I was his favorite. And when I was sent back to the earth, I realized that no one else had gotten that email. Okay, so I have to tell you this perspective so that you know that you could be doing everything right and feel like you're wrong. So when I go to the Lord and I check in with him and I pray in tongues and then I wait for the interpretation, what comes in the interpretation is you're doing better than you think. That's what he says to me. You're doing better than you think. And so that's enough for me to say, okay, I'm going to let this go. I'm just going to go about my business. So my character, if it was matching Jesus, the ministry was much more powerful than any anointing or any gift. See, this goes over very well. And how about if your character and you are more like Jesus, how about you don't have to do the things that people are doing? Because when did Jesus ever take an offering? I'm just asking for a friend. His name's Jesus. Now, think about it. Now, this is suicide. Any minister, they've already told me. The things that, that I'm saying and doing, it's suicide. In other words, I've told people, I've told people, 
please don't give. We don't, need your, we don't need any more money. We have too much. I've said that so many times. And the offerings quadruple. Okay? But what if your character is the most powerful thing to where money actually has to come? Because you're trusted. What if healing has to come because God must preserve you because you're his friend? What if it has nothing to do with what you think is faith? Working it up, you know, praying in tongues, fasting, watching your words. What if, because you chose to say, God, you're not going to do that because that's going to hurt your name. Like Moses did. There's only one other place in the Bible where anybody, a minister, ever said, please stop giving. And that was Moses. <laughs> Moses said, he asked for the gold and silver uh, earrings and all the, all the jewelry that they had borrowed from the Egyptians for life. They had borrowed it for life, you know. <laughs> and um, and he, they were going to make all of the, uh, the, the, the tabernacle uh, implements, okay? And uh, I asked Jesus, just so you know, because I, I, I asked the hard questions. I asked Jesus, I said, what about this uh, borrowing the jewelry when you, they knew that they weren't coming back? That's stealing. He said, no, they weren't stealing. He said, I was paying them back for 400 years of, of free labor in Egypt. Yes. I go, okay, good, good to know. I hope they tithed off of that. You know, no. <laughs> All right, so Moses actually says, stop. We don't need any more. We have too much. It's the only other time that anybody's ever said that. So the Lord started asking me to do that because there was so much emphasis on giving and prosperity that the Lord was saying, you need to unhook people. And so what I, I would tell people is, you don't have to give if you don't want to. Please don't give. If you don't want to give, please don't. But I also would announce this. I said, did you know that if you never gave again, you could still go to heaven? If you never gave another offering, did you know you could still go to heaven? Oh, boy. <laughs> See, what happens is you start messing with the system. Then you're going to realize how powerful that system is. And how, how confining it is. Because what I'm noticing is, is that we migrate toward one side of the road or the other, but never stay in the center. Now, you know that giving is biblical, and you know that God does bless you if you give. But it's, a, it's an act of your will. And so if you start to feel pressured, you know, if I'm going to say, we're going to go under if you don't give... I mean, that's not faith, right? <coughs> See, giving should be worship. And you should want to give more than you should receive. But what happens is, in a, in a world that's confining and restrictive, you, people get into a survival mode. I can, they want to conserve. And they realize that there's more going out than it's coming in. What was one of the things that God told David not to do? Count the fighting men. Do not count the army. What does this say in the scripture? Satan rose up and tempted David to count. And what happened? They started losing. Okay, so we're not to trust in the arm of man or in the horses. We're supposed to be, the strength should be in the, in the Lord, the spirit of the Lord. That is where our help comes from. That's where our deliverance comes from. Okay, so if you're going to click out of a survival mode, then you're going to have to realize that, well, what I have really is God's to begin with. And how I, how I'm going to, where I'm going to get to from here is going to be a miracle. It's not going to be because I'm conserving or doing this. In other words, you're smart and you manage your money well, 
But what about your health? Do you manage your health well? I mean, do, should Jesus have to appear in your house and lay hands on you when you're sick, or can you change your diet too? In other words, what I'm trying to say is character causes you to do things that have to do with a relationship where God can say, listen, here's what you do with your finances. Here's what you do with your health. And then do we really honestly always need a miracle of healing or do we need some corrective measures too as well? Okay, so you get it? With our finances. So what happens is, is I lay hands on people for their finances or their health or deliverance. And, and that's what would happen is the Lord would show me, well, if they don't stop this, um, they're not going to get healed. Well, I, uh, how am I going to... I mean, that's, that's not going to bring in a big offering. You know, like if I start telling people like, hey, listen, it's your fault. So you see the pressure that's on ministers is if they would actually speak the truth, it would bring correction, but it was, it's needed because, because you can see that you're on a road that's going to have things happen and that you can't expect God to just heal you all the time if it's something that you can do. It's the same way with your finances and everything else. Is everybody okay? If I was in Texas, I'd hear all kinds of safeties being clicked off on their pistols. But you, I know you guys got knives. Click, click. You know, I'm like, oh boy, I better. What happens is, is we forget how Jesus was as a person. Is he always went to the root of everything. But see, now, it, the people that go to the root of something, they don't last very long. <laughs> if you start saying, listen, just so you know, God's not at fault. <laughs> well, people, 50% of a congregation will get offended because God's in control. God's always in control. And it's like they say that. And I'm like, yeah, so that Twinkie you just ate and that burrito and all these, uh, you know, like, well, I don't know what you guys have here that's bad because you, the, 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 you know, the European Union won't allow bad stuff here, you know, so I could live forever here. <laughs> but why is it that all the ingredients, like, why is it twice the ingredients in the same thing I buy here, why is there twice the ingredients on the list in the U.S.? Because it's all these big names. When you look them up, they kill you. There's chemicals that are, aren't in yours. It's the same box. It's just a different language, you know. But why is it... Why is it that I can eat at McDonald's and lose a pound and a half? Yes. I ate at McDonald's when I was in Germany as a test because they said, if you eat, I called it the American Embassy. <laughs> I said, take me to the embassy. <laughs> so they take me to the yellow arches and they had, and um, they said, You'll, they, 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 none of that stuff is allowed here. So I, I would have a, I would have a Big Mac in each hand. I ate 11 times, and I lost a pound and a half when I got home. <laughs> Clean bill of health. Okay, so Jesus would say, listen, check what's in the ingredients, because some of these things are not good for your body. Okay. So, yes, I'll heal you, but please don't buy that again. Do you get it? Is this okay? okay it's the same thing with your finances and with everything else, with, with demons. It's like, okay, the demon's going to go, but next time, don't watch Netflix. <laughs> or don't, don't, don't allow this situation to happen anymore. In other words, Satan wants to get you reunited to that demon. But he's got seven friends, according to Jesus. If you want to bring Jesus into the conversation. So these are the things that I saw in heaven is that I want to be attached to Jesus' personality and his character because when I'm just, I don't know how to say this, so I'm just going to say it, is when God sends you somewhere, everything has to obey the will of the Lord for you when you're sent. So it's not like, where am I going to get this money? Where am I going to get this food? 
How are we going to get this camera? How are we going to do this? It's not like that. It's like, no, I was sent, and my character is stronger than the anointing. Amen. But see, when I say that, it sounds sacrilegious. But I'm telling you, where does it say anything about Enoch's mantle, his anointing? Where, who was his mentor? It was his character. He pleased God so much that God said, I'm taking you with me. I mean, that is huge. That is my goal down here. That's why I don't want you to call me any five-fold minister. I don't even want to be a minister. I just want to be Kevin. No, I just want to fly everywhere on my own plane, pay for my own bills, and just preach the good news, and I don't want any reward for it. Why? Because I know how this works. Being a minister is not an occupation. It's a lifestyle. It's, it's who you are as a person. The devil knows this. Listen, the devil knows everything I'm saying right now. The devil knows all this. He doesn't want anyone else to know it. And it's kind of sad, isn't it, that I had, to, I had to have this experience and go to heaven to find out what was actually being taught the whole time in the Bible. And you've got so many Bibles in your house, and you only need one that's in your mouth that you speak. And um, this, is the, this is what I want you to hear, is that if you allow God to form your character then what you walk in is not definable. Amen. And I know that's hard. I know that you can't grasp some things. But I'm telling you something. When I was around Jesus, there was things about him that I cannot even put into words. And to tell you the truth, out of all the time that I've, I've spent with him, I have said maybe... Maybe it was probably under two, two hands full of words. So probably eight or nine words. I have said in hours, hours of conversation where I was not saying a word. There was one time it went on for five hours at night in a dream. I never got to speak one word. He never even said goodbye. He just walked off. Five hours in a dream, everything you see at Warrior Notes was given to me in that dream that we're doing now. Was in, he just he wasn't asking for my opinion. He goes, "Are you available on this date?" No. He was like, "Here it is. You're going to start the school. You're going to start the homeschooling. You're going to do this program. You're going to do this. You're going to be Captain Kevin now. You're not going to be Apostle or anything. You're going to be Captain Kevin. You're going to get all your jet ratings." You're going to be Captain Kevin, and the kids are going to love you. The kids are going to attach to you, and you're going to be a father. Amen. Uh, that's what he told me. But this is back when I didn't even have, I've never flown a jet at the time. He said, you're going to call this person, you're going to do this training, then you're going to do this, this. And for the last two years, I've done everything and became a captain impossible in two years. Not only that, flying military jets. Yes. And I'm a civilian. <laughs> okay, this is because of character. This is not because of anointing. It wasn't because the money came in. The money came in after I obeyed. That's character. But character is something that comes from God that he influences you. It's not something where you get good enough. It's not that. It's a quality that is not definable. Like I just told my staff in the back room while we were eating. I said, I would rather die than compromise. That's the kind of stuff I say to my staff all the time. 
I said, I would rather just like cut it short right now in a good position and go be with the Lord and have that for eternity on my record than to start acting like some of, the, of what I'm seeing here. Some of the, I call them numbskulls. I don't know what else to call them. This is, this is not the way it's supposed to be. I'm not here to try to get you to do anything. I'm here just like you want to be here and represent God. I'm representing the Lord Jesus Christ. I met him. He changed my life. He is the one I worship. He's the one that I will die for. But he's also the one that I will live for. And I am going to do this even if I have to go back to work to pay for it. And I'll even send Kathy back to work. But it'll be at a purse store. <laughs> at a shoe store. <laughs> see, see how happy she is? <laughs> because what I believe in is so strong that I was, I'd be willing to not just do it for free, but to have to pay to do it. That sounds kind of strange in a ministry center scenario, doesn't it? Okay, but this is why we have hirelings. So you know about the hirelings in the Bible. And Jesus talked about people that were family and were lifers. You see, in the family, if you have a family restaurant, the family manages the restaurant. Well, Listen, I mean, I, I know because I grew up. I grew up on the East Coast where it was predominantly 80, 90% Catholic, all Italian. And I'm not Italian or Catholic. But it was 90, 80, 90%. Okay? There, they had the best food because it was Italian. I mean, they didn't mess up anything. Even, even Chinese food was good. Because the Italians somehow could do it, you know. But what, what I notice about the East Coast is that the family, they stuck up for each other. So I would call my friend who they had a restaurant, you know. But, you know, hey, let's go roller skating. Let's just, oh, no, um, my sister, it was her shift to be manager on duty and she's not feeling well, so I'm going to fill in with her. And that's what they did. It's like if one of the family members couldn't do it, then somebody else just had to sacrifice their Friday night because that was the biggest revenue night was Friday and Saturday night, you know. And they, it was just understood, you know, the family, like, no, this is our business. Okay, so there are cultures that understand what I'm saying. But then there's the culture where... You're an individual, and you do whatever you can, even if you have to step on people, even if you have to steal, even if you have to do these things. And that culture got into the church. Okay, so it works because you can run a church or a ministry like a business and make money, but you have to know how to talk. You have to know how to talk to people about things so that it becomes their, your idea, but it's really the minister's idea. So I can't say much more, but I'm telling you, I know the back end of all this. I know how it works behind the scenes. So I stole the playbook. So, if I wanted to, I could say anything to get you to do something. And it wouldn't be God. I could, I could nudge you in a certain direction by hinting. <laughs> then what happens? Well, not only is that not character, but then the Spirit of God is not allowed to work. It's just like saying... We're not taking any offerings anymore. You can't do that because you have to have the ability to give because it's part of worship. That is between you and God. And if you read the scripture, especially in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, 
It shows that you're laying up treasure for yourself in heaven so that also when you're in need, you can tap into that. But not only that, someday, if you're helping someone, Paul said now, that has a bump in the road, they said, he said, he said, someday you might have a bump in the road and then they who were poor will be able to help you because you helped them in a hard time. Okay, so the best thing you can do for many reasons is to do what you would want done for you, is to do it for someone else. So if you're sick, you need to pray for people to be healed. If you need money, you need to give to someone else to help them. But you don't necessarily have to give to a minister. I mean, did you, when Jesus was talking to the rich man, let's be honest, the rich young ruler, he said, he's sitting there listening. This guy said, I have obeyed the law perfectly since a child. Okay, he's telling the Son of God that he's been perfect. He's telling Jesus, I've, I've obeyed the law completely, perfectly since birth, or, you know, from a child. And Jesus is like, this boy's about to fall. What does it say? It says, he looked at him and loved him. That's what Jesus did. Because the Gospels say, after he said that, Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, well, he just lacked one little thing. And this is what he did. He went, this is what I wanted to share with you that I've never shared. Jesus goes after the root. He said, you just lack one thing. Just sell everything you have. Don't give it away. Sell it, take the money and take the money and give it to the poor so that you're not going to give your stuff away to your friends who will store it for you so you can get it back later. And the poor, you'll never get it back. So sell it, take the money, and give it to the poor. So that makes it impossible for the rich man to ever go back. Bingo. The one small thing that he lacked was he worshipped money. Okay? So, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. But you would think, let's be honest, would you be honest with me? Because Jesus wants to know. Today, sell everything you have and give it to my ministry and follow me. Now, be honest. Did Jesus say, give it to my ministry? No. I'll tell you why he didn't say that. He didn't need the money. He needed the man. Yes. <laughs> he wanted to make it so that he had the man. He would have got it all back, I'm sure. But who cares if he did or not, if he has eternal life. But see... Now it's like, well, you can have both, okay? So you can have both. What happens when you lose your job? It's because you stood up for Christ. You stand up for Christ, then you have no income. And it goes on for years. Because you won't take this, okay? So you won't, you won't take this, so you don't have a job, okay? Then, then, you're pressured to do something that you don't want to do. Well, what is the difference when you go to church and you're pressured to do something you don't want to do? Like, what, should it not be something that is in your own free will? I'm making you all nervous for a reason. Is the bottom line is from now on, you got to hear from God because you can't let somebody tell you what the truth is. You got to know the truth. And it's got to set you free. But you can't trust everyone because Jesus would take you to the wall. So what's next? So at what point do you say, no, I'm not going to do this?
At what point is it more profitable for you to just obey the Lord and trust him? Can you do that? Well, you can't do that with giftings and anointings and mantles. You do that with character. Because character means saying no when everything else is screaming yes. Based on what I've seen, anointings aren't helping people to make right decisions. Because they're running away with their secretaries. So obviously the anointing is strong as they're so anointed, but they can't say no. Is this too much? Do you want to talk about Noah's Ark and the animals? And no, what I'm trying to say is, Jesus wants your yes, but he also wants you to be able to say no if, it, if it's something that is going to cause you to be his friend, even if you lose everything. Pastor Curtis, can you take over? <laughs> the, the, the Jesus that I met he believes in you but he wants to have influence on you as a person which is beyond what we put our emphasis on so the word of God I saw that the word of God what the word of God does is it literally comes into you when you hear it and it changes, it, it causes your spirit to grow. Even though you're born again, it causes you to mature with, from within. It's bread, it's manna. So it's spiritual food, it really literally is. But it has to come out beyond the spirit into your soul. So that it influences the way you think. It makes you say no when you're supposed to say no. It makes you make decisions not based on what you want. Would you be willing to lose to gain him is what I'm trying to say. And you have to have that attitude. And I don't ever hear these messages being preached. I'm going to buy this CD myself. <laughs> no, think about it. Because he, he's totally worth it. He's totally worth any cost that it would, it would cost you. I mean, he told me, I mean, I'll tell you this. I wasn't going to, but I'll tell you this. He told me the reason why you're where you're at is because you encountered the pearl of great price and you went and sold everything you had to buy me. That's what he said to me. And so you got everything. Because you discerned and counted the cost. I went and left. Kathy left everything. We left everything to follow Christ. Because we discerned that he was worth it. And that's what the parable says. Is that you bought. You, when you find a treasure on a, on a ground and it's not yours. Property. What does it say? Cover it back up. Go buy the property. Don't say a word. And what is in the property is far more worth than what you paid for the property. That's what Jesus is to you. Okay, so I believe that how you have been talked into this, I believe that you have talked, you talked, and talked into this to where when you address devils now, it's not like you're working it up. You don't have to pray in tongues an hour before you address the devil. You just show up and you go, this is your last day here. You just tell the devil, this is your last day here. Start packing. You know, and I'm serious. Like There are times where I have not even used the name of Jesus. Can you believe that? They already knew what was coming. They didn't even stick around for my whole message. They didn't stick around for the, for the, you know, the exodus and the, the driving out. They spared me of all that. They just said, you know what? We'll just go. That's character. That's the Jesus that I met, and that's the mentor that I, that I have and you should have. Okay, so Paul said, listen, follow me as I follow Christ. So Paul was a good example of Jesus Christ. So he allowed people to follow him. 
But that was because he was representative of Jesus himself. And there was, there was no discrepancies between what he was preaching and what Jesus had given him in a message. If you remember, he was caught up, Paul was, and given the gospel by Jesus himself. So this is the person I met, is that all of us really need some work done on our roots. And um, we, we try to medicate and try to like um, somehow manage all of this that's going on in our lives when, when we're really a mess. And, and until you can love your enemies, if you're still hurt about what they've done, then you're not healed. The, the whole idea is to be completely disconnected from this world system so that people, it doesn't matter. Honestly, it doesn't matter what they do to you because they're going to face the judgment. And I do not want to see it. I don't want to be there. That line's going to be long. I'm not going to be in it. Can you trust Jesus to take care of those who have done you wrong? Yes. Enough to just let it go and, and, and live without cancer the rest of your life or intestinal problems or maybe your hair will grow back, you know, when you just like let it go. You'd be surprised what will happen. You're, even, even your finances might get healed. And, and you didn't do anything different except forgive. This is character. Forgiving, walking in love, is not anointing. It's not gifting. It's not a mantle. It's character. The fruit of the Spirit is literally in heaven. I mean, if you want to bring Jesus into it, Jesus showed me that the fruit of the Spirit is actually the personality of God. The fruit of the Spirit is actually his personality traits that are inside of us. And he's telling us that the life flow from the vine to the branches is, is through me. And it is the Spirit. And it is the fruit of the Spirit, which is my personality. And that's what I saw. And I saw that what, the fruit that comes through my life, like in John 15. Do you know that John 15 is talking about prayer? Did you know that? You should read John 15, abiding in me and abiding you. And if you do this, he said, you can ask whatever you desire. The word there is will or desire, not whatever you need. It says, ask what you will and it will be done for you. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask what you will. Sounds like prayer to me. I mean, without limitations. You should read it. You'll start crying. <laughs> Because you're like, oh my God, that's there. <laughs> so if you want to get all your prayers answered, just say, what, like I did this morning, what are we doing today, Lord? What are we doing? What are we doing today? What's, what's you up to? What do you want to tell the people? What, what is it that, that is on your heart? And then all your prayers get answered because you're not being selfish. Oh, boy. Let's open up another can of worms. What time is it? We got to, oh, we got to go. We got to go. I got to rest. Okay. I still got two seven-hour flights, I think, tomorrow. Two seven-hour flights, and then I got to preach six more times, and I got to come back up here to the Germans. I got to come to the Germans <laughs> for six, six more. So I got to fly 14 hours down and 14 hours back and pretend like everything's fine. <laughs> I'm going to start crying. <laughs> that's why we have other pilots too. So. Uh, thank you. At least we have one person that is being set free. You know, no, you all are set free. Set free. So the word, the word of God is literally a portion or the substance of God himself. When he speaks, he's speaking from his very substance. So when he speaks and you hear him, you have to realize that he gave a part of himself when he gave his word. So if you receive the word, you're receiving him. If, 
If the word is active and sharp within you, then you become sharp and active. So if God is speaking to you, then you find yourself speaking for God. Do you understand that the, there's been this disconnect? There, there's, there should be a flow. It should be like a fire hose instead of a little sprinkler system. But what happens is we don't understand what's important. And that is, is that our character is what we deal with the rest of our eternity. I want to go, but I have to share this. He just told me. But you remember that I've told you that he showed me that I had an assignment whenever I'm done down here. So he said, I'm going to come back and get you. And he said, you know, he, when he was with me, we were in an operating room. He said, there's this door, there's a portal door that he comes through because he still has his body. But please don't ask me to explain that because that's two weeks. But he still has his body. So he has access. There's other things he can do. He can walk through physical walls, but he can still eat. So Enoch's like that and Elijah's like that they still have their bodies. So they're the two witnesses in the book of Revelation, but I didn't tell you that. But, but uh, Jesus, Jesus told me that I'm going to come back and get you. And right where you're standing right now at this doorway is where me and you will meet again. And he had turned and sent me back to my body you know, back in 1992. And um, he said, but you're going to appear right here with me again, just like we are right now, is what he said at the time. And he said, I, he, walk, he walked away, and then I got sucked back into my body, into the operating room from this doorway, this bright doorway. And the Lord said, when I come back to get you, I will go down the hallway like I am now, but I'm going to turn around and I'm going to say to you, oh, you decided to come with me. And I'm, and I'm going to say yes. And it, it was as though I never came back here. But I had done all of this for 20, oh, 20, 30 years. It was all extra credit. It was like that. That will happen. But he said, where you end up here in your life in character is where you start with me in the next reign, the millennial reign. So he said, you want to tell the people to make sure that they understand that they're being proven. He called it probation. It was a probationary period where this life was just about qualifying for our our assignment with him. The worlds are so vast. This was like a little speck of dust, this earth. I mean, Switzerland's clean, but it was like a speck of dust, the whole earth. It was just nothing. It was, it was so insignificant in comparison to the vastness of his kingdom and all the universes and the galaxies. And it was just... It's just beyond words. He, he showed me that I was going to start where I left off down here. So he said, tell people to make sure they're diligent to qualify by letting the Spirit of God lead you and train you and teach you so that when you cross over, um, there were places, I, I don't understand it, but there were places where people had to go for training. There was other things that you're always learning. So... Everybody wanted to go to the throne room, but not everybody went to the throne room at the same time. There was people that were out and about doing other things, assignments, and then they would come in. And then you had your appointed time to meet with God. And you just kind of knew. But all of you, remember this. Don't go after the anointing. Because really, honestly, the anointing is on the anointed one who is inside of you. Amen. And in the Old Testament, 
you better be anointed because there was nothing else. They didn't have the spirit within. They had the spirit upon. And if God didn't talk to the prophets, God didn't talk to nobody. If you remember, that's Old Testament. In the New Testament, we're all kings and priests. I mean, if you want to bring scripture into it. Wow. Wouldn't it be easier if you just walked into a funeral and they would just pop out of the casket instead of having to go through all, okay, I need some room here. You, you're doubt and get out. You, you know, I got to have, I got to raise the dead here, you know. You gotta, what, if, what if you just walked in it like Jesus did and said, oh, she's not dead. She's just asleep. He was doing everything as the son of man, not as the son of God. Because he said, you're going to do the same things. What were the same things? He, he labeled them. Raise the dead, cast out the demons, heal the sick, and preach the good news. Proclaim jubilee, which is debt cancellation. So all of us are qualified to do that. But wouldn't it be nicer if the demons just knew what was going to happen anyway? Everywhere, everywhere we go, it gets just like this. There's no demons in here. Okay, but not one screamed. I didn't point and say, go in the name of Jesus. I didn't have like a knockout wrestling match with one or, you know, none of this two hours talking to him. What's your name? What's your mom's name? <laughs> you know, what do you do? How long you been with the devil? You know? get a whole bio on the guy, you know? No. What if, because you're known as a son or a daughter of God, that wherever you go, it's a demon-free zone? I used to feel bad that demons didn't manifest. Then I realized they all left quietly because they didn't want to confront. They didn't want to have to go through that. Look at you all. <laughs> what if you were so free that the devil didn't want to have to deal with you? What if he already knew, had received the notification that you are off the list? Amen. Do not touch. How about do not contact? <laughs> huh? Listen, this is doable. This is doable. I'm going to pray for you. And then you pray for me because I'm going to go rest. <laughs> All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving us your wisdom and knowledge. Thank you, Lord, that it's just permanent, that it's fruit that lasts. Everyone will encounter you permanently and they will never go back. And I thank you, Lord, that you've healed and delivered so many here in this room. And I thank you, Lord, that you, your revelation flows permanently. And that, Lord, you've given them the confidence that they can walk in character and in your personality. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you.